Um, thank you all for, for joining us um, for this week's feature of Lackawanna Past in advance of Black History Month. And as by sort of happy accident on Martin Luther King weekend, um, we're excited to welcome Glynis Johns, the founder of the Black Scranton Movement. Um, Glynis received her BA and MA in sociology from St. John's University. She's the founder of the nonprofit Black Scranton, Black Scranton Project, uh, a local heritage initiative and public, public history venture dedicated to celebrating and archiving Black history in Scranton and Northeastern Pennsylvania. A native Scrantonian, local historian, sociologist, artist, documentarian, and advocate, Glynis spends a lot of time researching Scranton in an attempt to piece together the narratives of the Black community. For Glynis, passions and projects are indistinguishable from each other. She's proud to shift local perspectives on culture, inclusion, representation, and history. She was recently recognized in the March 2020 issue of Happenings Magazine as one of the most influential women in NEPA and by the NEPA Business Journal's Top 20 Under 40 Young Business Professionals as a 2019 honoree. Um, so with, with that said, Glynis, I'll turn the program over to you. Um, and again, everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, if you could unmute, um, if you could mute yourselves um, so there's no weird feedback and crossover. Um, Glynis, I'll turn the program over to you. Thank you. Sarah, okay. and thank you to okay. the Lackawanna Historical Society for having me today. Um, huge shout out to the Lackawanna, Historic, Lackawanna Historical Society because they have been um, a huge support to this initiative. Marianne helped me get a first large grant to do this work. And here we are now as a nonprofit doing a lot of things in the community. And um, so I give a lot of that credit to you for the support and to the Historical Society for being a valuable resource to me and the community as well. So um, yeah, this is cool that it um, lands on Martin Luther King weekend. Um, I think this is a great time to reflect on Martin Luther King as the man and the movement. I think as especially as a young person, we don't really realize that he was a young man when he started around the same age as me, 26, when he started his activism um, and hitting the streets and getting locked up and facing police violence and brutality in the name of civil rights and social justice. And um, for me, it's really interesting to see um, his passion and seeing the things that he was able to accomplish in his short lifetime. Um, and if he was still alive today, he would be um, amongst his colleagues like Cic uh, Cic Cicely Tyson um, and folks like her. So I always think about him and his mission outside of how we know him as the man from the March on Washington, but he also really cared and was dedicated to a lot of the things that I also think are important, like fair and equal housing, like um, creating resources and spaces for people of color, Black folks specifically, and making sure that um, we create inclusive neighborhoods and make that something that isn't rare or something that we have to push for, but something that's a birthright. So um, in honor of MLK, those are the things that I think about yearly on MLK Day, but also thinking about um, our local um, heroes and our local leaders, because we always think that MLK was the only one, but we never think about who our local hero heroes are and who our local um, folks were that were carrying the movement here in Northeastern Pennsylvania. So today I'm going to um, talk a little bit about the Black Scranton Project, what, what we do, what I do, and then I'm going to give you guys a screening of Uncommon Knowledge, which is a local history series that I will be um, putting more broadly on the internet in February. So like Sarah said, the Black Scranton Project, we are a local heritage initiative and we are dedicated to archiving and sharing the Black and African American history here in NEPA. I started this work um, as a graduate student at St. John's University getting my master's in sociology. Um, I really wanted to complete a graduate thesis because I felt like my writing wasn't strong. I really didn't like writing and I thought this would be an accomplishment that I could be proud of and close that chapter and move on to something else. At the time, I wasn't really sure what it is that I wanted to study, um, but after coming back from New York City to Scranton um, during like a Thanksgiving break, I was out, um, you know, as young people do the night before Thanksgiving, and I ran into some folks and um, uh, a, a girl was actually, we went to the same high school, same graduating class, and she was shocked that she didn't know who I was because, quote, she knew all the black kids in our graduating class. And so that kind of struck me because I just felt like, a lot of folks always assume that if you're black, you're not from here. And if you do, you have a catalog and you know, you know, your neighbor, this person or whatever, you're supposedly supposed to know these folks. And if you don't, then 
they're not from here. So I wanted to debunk that stereotype. And so um, when I went back to campus, I started to think about how long African Americans have been here and what that looked like. So I took a trip to the Historical Society, talked with Marianne, see what was there. Um, there wasn't much at the time and um, just trying to find any other resources. I went to the library, I went to the Anthracite Museum and each place didn't have much to offer. And um, at that point I was thinking maybe this will be a short project. Um, what is there out there? Where do I look? I don't know where to turn. Um, I started digging into um, some old newspapers using newspapers.com, which is a very incredible resource that I love to use every single day. I've read way more newspapers from last century than this current century. Um, and I started to uncover a lot of stories. I started to uncover the black community, where people were, what they were saying, the neighborhoods that they lived in, the businesses, the people, the movements, the contributions to um, the civil rights movements of the late 1800s and into the turn of the century, all of these things that I had no idea existed in the context of Scranton. And so once I completed my graduate thesis, which was basically explaining that there was a black community here, there still is one, and that this is proof to debunk the stereotype that black folks aren't from Scranton. But alongside of that work, I wanted to understand why the black community is seen as transient. Why aren't we ever allowed to be part of the cultural heritage of Scranton, Pennsylvania? Why is it that we are always coming from somewhere else for a brief amount of time? Why are we seen as criminals? And why are we seen as non-contributors? When this work, I found all these things about the black community, which then really solidified my own identity and made me feel proud of the person that I am, my legacy and the generations of my family that have been here. So once I graduated in 2017, I decided that I should come back to Scranton and share this work with whoever would listen. I did a few talks at the University of Scranton, um, virtual talks here and there in schools. I decided to become um, a substitute teacher and the main reason was if there wasn't any uh, uh, curriculum that the teacher had left, I wanted to just tell the kids about local history and then have them write a little paragraph about it and give it back to me and give it back to the teacher because I wanted at least the kids to like, start to know something. And um, you know, it was a selfish little motive for me, but I thought it was worth it. And my time there also made me realize that all of these kids in the Scranton School District were so um, appreciative of the fact that they were able to sit in the classroom with a young black woman from the city who actually went to the same school as them and is now a substitute teacher. And so to be able to also touch the lives of all of these kids and inspire them was something that wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for this work. And um, it really opened my eyes to the fact how valuable it is to see teachers that are non-white and also come from the same neighborhoods as you in the same perspective because um, all the kids were like, just, it was cool. And that was another selfish thing for me, which is to really be, was to show these kids that like, you're capable, you're able to do these things. Like you don't have to fit the stereotypes of what a teacher actually is. And here I am, I'm from, I went to the same school as you, was in the, had the same teacher at one point, And now look, I can sit in the class and help you prepare to be, you know, an upstanding citizen of the world and do creative career paths. And you don't have to just take a traditional way to end up as a historian. Cause I never thought that I would be here. So that is, um, a little bit of backstory about the Black Scranton project and my journey to get here. Um, after 2017 and 2018, um, I received a grant from the Willery Foundation to do this work more full time. By 2019, Black Scranton project was a nonprofit and I would say this is a testament to the ancestors that we were able to become a nonprofit organization incorporated on Juneteenth, June 19th of 2019. So um, last year, 2020, we started to lock in a lot of um, uh, um, local traditions for the Black community. We raised the Pan-African flag for the first time in the city of Scranton, um, February 1st, which we'll, we, we will be doing again as a annual tradition. It's first time in the city to honor African Americans locally and nationally. Juneteenth was our second annual Juneteenth celebration, but in light of um, the Black Lives Matter movement and the civil unrest that is happening, we figured it would be a really important thing to uh, do an outdoor celebration, protest, enjoy, and love 
for the black community. And we saw almost a thousand people come out to Nayak Park safely, had some free ice cream, some music, the kids got to come out, the older folks got to come out, people brought their dogs, the babies had a good time and there were zero cases associated with our um, event. So I was very proud of that and shout out to Procter and Gamble that made sure there was masks and hand sanitizer and the like there. So we're doing a lot of things. Um, we're getting ready to open a community center so we can do this work more pronounced, um, be actually involved in the community so that way we can, you know, create change and start to incorporate African Americans into the historical um, framework of Scranton and also create resources for young people, um, create a new archive, create space to mobilize, to celebrate, to create art, to create history, um, culture, all of that. So hopefully sometime in 2020, we'll, we will be announcing and opening the doors of a community center, which I'm super excited to share more information about once I can. So um, yeah, so that's myself in the Black Scranton Project in 14 minutes. Um, I am going to share you share with you guys a screening of Uncommon Knowledge. Um, and again, Uncommon Knowledge is a local history series that we're starting. Um, I wanted to come up with a new way to share um, historical gems in a way that's digestible. Um, as we live in the social media age, a lot of people don't like to read blog posts um, or, you know, consume information the ways that we have done in the past. And I wanted to start creating things that are shareable, um, a collection that maybe can be brought into classrooms um, that are accessible so that these names are no longer just something that I hold on to that are locked away in my thesis, but then become something that is celebrated because I really do feel like it is time that these people are honored for their, their work and their commitment to the community and are just as important as some of the quote unquote founding fathers, um, you know, the things that are around here. And I want to open the eyes to people to show that there are racial disparities here in the city that continue to create the idea that Black folks are transient. There is systematic racism that continues to erase um, the Black history and culture here in the city. And um, this work hopes to um, revitalize that and then start to create a place for it within the city of Scranton. So this is Uncommon Knowledge. This is what our series will kind of look like here. Um, and the next slide is the video for Uncommon Knowledge. It's about 11 minutes. Um, hopefully the audio comes through clearly and the visuals come through. So I will stop here and let you guys enjoy um, the screening. Common Knowledge is a local Black history series by the Black Scranton Project, which highlights noteworthy figures and moments unique to Scranton's African American experience. These are stories we recovered from a forgotten past that deserve to be shared and celebrated. Today, as we navigate the racialized impact of COVID-19 and the demand for racial justice and equity by the Black Lives Movement, we felt this individual's legacy was too inspiring and too timely. It's only right that Dr. James E. Foster kicked off this series. James E. Foster studied at Yale University and received his doctorate in medicine from Howard University in 1903. He practiced for some time in Harrisburg before he moved to Scranton a few years later. He had a private practice and offices in downtown Scranton. Dr. Foster had an impressive 35-year career in the field of medicine. He was one of the city's leading doctors during the 1918 flu pandemic. The 1918 flu pandemic infected 500 million people worldwide and resulted in 50 million deaths around the globe, 675,000 of which were American. But while viruses don't discriminate, people do. And in cities across the nation, Black people struck by the flu were often left to fend for themselves. In the winter of 1918, an entire family fell ill with the virus. A household of 10 and only the 11-year-old daughter who evaded the virus had to take care of the large family. According to the Scranton Tribune, Dr. Foster was, quote, called to give treatment. The family was practically penniless, but the local physician supplied medicine, paying for it out of his own pocket, end quote. Although infection rates were much less than African Americans during the 1918 pandemic, it still overwhelmed their medical and public health resources. Racist theories claiming biological inferiority of Black people affected the quality of care in medicine, which increased their susceptibility to disease and illnesses. Black physicians, Dr. James E. Foster included, fiercely contested such theories and stressed that African-American health disparities reflected socioeconomic inequalities, not physiological and biological differences or inferiority. 
National Negro Health Week was created in 1915, and it was the largest and most significant campaign that focused on educating Black communities throughout America on methods of acquiring health care and informing students on proper health care practices. Dr. Foster is the reason why National Negro Health Week was recognized in our city. He was leading conversations and advocating for programs that support the health and wellness of Black people, not just in Scranton, but throughout Northeastern Pennsylvania. In fact, Dr. Foster was a chairman of the National Negro Health Commission. He organized, facilitated, and oversaw many of the programs that took place across the region. Dr. James E. Foster was our city's first Black doctor who was saving lives in the midst of a national health crisis and was successful at it and was praised for having, quote, the lowest death rate of any doctor in the city. In addition to being on the front lines of a global pandemic, he often spoke publicly and unapologetically about racial inequalities and inequities that disenfranchise Black Scrantonians. Dr. Foster wanted to build a foundation for our Black community. He was one of the folks, more than a century ago, that believed in the importance of creating spaces for Black people. In fact, it was his idea to create a Black community center, the Progressive Civic and Recreation Association, better known as the Progressive Center today. Dr. Foster passed away in August of 1949 at the age of 69. He loved the city of Scranton and invested a lot of time, energy, and his own resources to ensure that Black Scrantonians could thrive in all aspects of life for generations to come. Downtown Scranton looked very different in the 1930s. Do you see the Hotel Casey on the right? It was built in 1909 and it was once the largest hotel in Northeastern Pennsylvania. It had 11 floors and 250 rooms. Although many black residents were employed staff here, African-American travelers were not allowed to lodge. Before the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which outlawed discrimination by private business owners, establishments like the Hotel Casey had the right to deny accommodations to black people. But guess what? We had a black owned hotel and it was pretty popping. Newport Hotel opened in 1906 on the 300 block of Center Street between Penn and Wyoming Avenues. The hotel was, quote, famed for being one of the best hotels for colored people in the state, according to regional newspapers. The entire block, though, was demolished some decades ago to make way for new construction. Now, the Electric City parking garage consumes the whole block and no trace of our historic black neighborhood exists. In the late 19th and early 20th century, the black neighborhoods were tucked in the courts and alleys of downtown Scranton. For a long time, downtown Scranton was home to the majority of the African-American community. Center Street was literally the center of black entertainment and leisure. Local newspapers called the Newport Hotel headquarters to local and visiting black folks. The Newport Hotel was owned by a man named Charles Susky Battle. He was born in Knoxville, Maryland in 1869, and he moved to Scranton when he was a teenager. He waited tables at a local diner until he had enough money to start his own business. Susky was a local legend, and we'll have to spotlight the rest of his story later. Anyway, the hotel had a cabaret with a black jazz orchestra and entertainers. The excitement often didn't kick off until after midnight, and before Prohibition, the drinks flowed, the music bumped, cigars burned, and Black folks partied into the morning. The Scranton Times in 1912 had an op-ed that said this, quote, His hotel accommodates the traveled coloring theatrical man, the sporting man, the prize fighter, the colored missionary, the stranger, and the native and in his care they receive every accommodation, protection, and courtesy that was possible. He made money in that place, but he gave as he made, and instead of dying wealthy, he died rich only in the steam of his race." End quote. After Charles Battle passed away in 1912, his wife carried on the business for about a year before retiring with the obligations of hotel management. She sold the hotel to two local African-American men, William Hopkins and Walter Scott. The two new owners had plans to make over the hotel and bring it up to 1913 standards. They upgraded the exterior. The front facade was now constructed of an appealing brick. The basement was supposedly transformed into a billiard room and barber shop. The first floor was a general office, reading room and cafe, a dining room on the second floor, sleeping rooms on the third, and a meeting and ballroom on the top floor. Prohibition proved too much for the hotel. 
on New Year's Eve in 1923 would be the last night that the Newport Hotel would offer entertainment and leisure to Black Samaritonians and the Black travelers that needed a place to stay while in the Electric City. The Newport Hotel was forced to close its doors January 1st of 1924, and the iconic Center Street Hotel was swiftly transformed into a storeroom for the Cleveland Simpson Company, the proprietors of the Globe Store Warehouse. series Uncommon Knowledge, um, and I figured that would be a better presentation than a PowerPoint. So if anybody has any questions or wants to learn about any of the of the people and businesses that we mentioned, um, I can definitely answer some questions now. <laughs> <laughs> that was excellent, Glennis. Marianne and I are messaging each other back and forth that we're super jealous of your video. <laughs> that was, that was incredible. Um, okay, thank great. you for sharing that. Um, if anybody has any any questions, um, please chime in um, for a, a few minutes here if you have any questions. Linus, was that you riding the bike? That was me. <laughs> <laughs> I like the yellow snakes. <laughs> Thanks. 
I like that yeah. when you started talking about your program, I, I liked that you said that the black community is often seen as, as non-contributors. I think that's a, that's a good way to, to describe it, unfortunately. Um, you know, we so often over, overlook that, that element of, um, of black history in, in Scranton. Um, is there, did you come across a person who was like a favorite um, as, as you're starting to look into, look into more and more of the history? Um, do you have a, do you have a favorite that you, you know, are, are more impressed with or like more than others? Um, we tend to find historical boyfriends as we're going. Uh, but if you have a, a, a favorite as you're from your research. That's just um, because Sarah collects them. So she's well, <laughs> I do, but you know. <laughs> um, that's a hard question because I love everything that I find, but um, Mrs. Louise Tanner Brown has been my idol and uh, a source of light and a source of, of encouragement. And um, I'm very, it's been really cool to watch the state pick up her story and her legacy and start honoring her for the work that she's done. So right now, Louise is still my girl. And, um, and especially because of um, the women's suffrage movement of 2020 and still now into 2021, a lot of people have been asking about her story. I'm still working on putting something more cohesive for her biography. It's really hard because um, I can only really use the newspapers and some of the state archives. I think I might be able to find some more things that are kind of off limits with COVID. But um, yeah, she continues to inspire, inspire me every single day. And the more I learn about her and um, even like I'll read some of her favorite poems just to get like closer to her, to see the things that she was interested in. So yeah, she's um, still my girl, my fave currently. <laughs> I thought it was. Oh, I, I have. I just want to know where was the Draymond Company located in Scranton? Yeah. Um, that was one thing I did want to explain more because the video and by fast because the compilation I did for um, the Scranton Fringe Under Glass a few months ago, so I had to keep it under 11 minutes, so I had to speed up the words so that way I didn't go over. Um, but the company, the Drain Co. was on um, Lackawanna and Cliff Street, so where um, the Marts bus terminal is currently is where oh. the building used to be. So it was a five-story brick warehouse. Um, <laughs> And they did a lot of things inside of the warehouse besides run a business. At one point, they had um, a Black-owned publishing company. So they were printing their own Black-owned newspaper for a couple of years there. Um, so it was, at one point, a hub for just community events. If people needed a meeting space, they would use it as well. But the property got torn down sometime between the 19, I want to say, the 19, late 1940s to the 19. 50s maybe. Um, I know there was some legal action where the city was trying to buy and destroy the property to make way for um, uh, the, the railroad tracks because across the street is the that old um, that old bus, that old train station. And so when they were putting that together and planning that out in the 1900s, they were saying that they needed the property across the street and they wanted to take out his stuff. But the legal documents are in a different type of jargon I can barely understand. So um, I would love to see when exactly they, what happened and how it went away, but that's where what, it is. What happened to the newspapers? Um, so the newspaper was called uh, the Scranton Defender, which was like the child paper of the Chicago Defender, which was created by W.E.B. Du Bois in the early 1900s. And um, what's his name? Something, something Atwood was the, was the head editor publisher. Um, so they had a couple other, um, I guess, branches of the Chicago Defender. New York had one for some time. Scranton had one. And a couple other cities. Um, and so they had their section in Scranton that ran from 1905, 1904 to like 1906. And it kind of like fizzled out because of um, complications and miscommunications with management and operating. And um, some one of the employees or somebody was like in, embezzling money or not getting people subscriptions out. It was a big mess. And so it didn't really last that long, but a couple of the, um, the newspaper is available on microfilm, like through the state library, which I want to get again because the last time I looked at it, I had to like rush through reading it. But um, yeah, so that's pretty cool. Okay, thanks. Liz, when was the paper published? Um, I think it was, I think 1904, 1904 to 1906 or 1905 to 1907, something like that. Okay. Have, have you yep. seen issues of it or? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually got to, um, you can request it through the Scranton Public Library, but you have to view it in the library. Okay. So I haven't been able, I did that like what, two, 2017? It's been a while since I've looked at it, but I wanted to get it again to like more thoroughly read it to find out because that was like the only publication really that was like printing news like exclusively about what was happening in the black community here and so i really want to um not just skim through it for people because really i was just looking to see like what they were saying more so about some of the people i already knew or if there's anything in extra like interesting that i can include in this thesis because i only had a short amount of time so i was kind of just leaping through each page for two years um, but i would like to actually sit down and like really read the paper and see what they were talking about how many people have you written about? <clears throat> I know you showed a few because we you only have so much time here. But um, so at one point this year and last, I haven't really had as much time. But at one point, I was trying to do a blog post every month or every couple of months. So I think um, in total, probably about like maybe twenty stories I was able to talk oh. about between figures, um, just little events, or this day in history news mm -hmm. articles. Um, but yeah, I'm working on uh, maybe publishing a book where I can compile all these stories somewhere, do something, but I would like to make it more accessible for everybody to actually use as a resource. Um, so yeah, every day I find some, not every day, but I find new things all the time and new people that I've discovered um, and just that finding their stories is incredible. It's no easy task because my main source, like I said, is the is newspapers.com and the newspapers. And so if they were so lucky to be chosen to talk about in the newspapers in a positive light, that's really all you get. And also a lot of times it's bias. And sometimes you have to really kind of look at the language because um, a lot of times it's some of the things are kind of like condescending or you'll find a lot of times they'll like spell their names wrong, which sometimes I feel like is an intentional thing um, or just leave out important gaps of information. But um, there are a few other newspapers like the New York Age, which was a majority black audience newspaper of the 1900s that had a section like every week about what's going on in Scranton with the black community. So I would, I look at that a lot to kind of get a better idea of what was happening, especially they would do like, you know, what's happening in the community, like Louise Brown had a little dinner party and these are the people that were invited or so and so came from New York and did a talk on X, Y and Z or, you know, those kind of things are something that we see in the Scranton Republican for every other organization or group and stuff or communities, but not necessarily for the black community. So you have to use alternate routes when you're studying African American history. Have you ever you probably did not have the time, but have you ever tried to find some of the generations that may be living today to inquire about their ancestry or? Not anything? really, that's its own project. Um, so mm -hmm. no, <laughs> um, but I <laughs> would, would like be to, difficult. Just doing genealogy is just a whole nother ball game. Mm -hmm. And I kind of just am sticking more to <laughs> right now. Mm -hmm. what I can find in the community and hoping that people would say, oh, that was my great grandmother or, hey, I know more about this person, you know, like I'm hoping that can happen or like people that say, hey, I want to start digging the genealogy of this family or person. So that's kind of where I'm at. Um, but I just kind of want to start getting the general stories so that they can be built upon or give people a way to look or like a direction to look or, you know, stuff like that. But I thought it was very interesting. I really like what you did. Really interesting. Glennis, I have a question relative to the black newspaper in Scranton. Does the Scranton Public Library hold it or do they have to requisition a copy of that microfilm for a patron from the State Library in Harrisburg? Yeah, you have to request it and you only get to have it for two weeks or something like that. You don't get to have it long, so. Is there any way that, you know, it's a cheap process to duplicate a microfilm and since it just since it is such a short run of two years yeah. uh, i have to see because i, I want what can I would be like done to have a, a a copy in scranton either at the public library or at the historical society yeah i mean if there's a way i don't i never tried to ask if we could scan the film but i would love to if they'd let me Yeah, well, it's worth pursuing i think it should be here and not I just agree. in harrisburg right. and you know request on demand and that, that's not uh, good service. That, that would be something we could, we, we could look into that too to see if 
I, I'm making a note. I'm going to call the library and see what we can find out. I'd be willing to help you on that, Marianne, if that is welcome. You are always welcome. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. I, I don't know if anybody here is familiar with a video that was made a few years back about the Hotel Casey, about its being built and, you know, essentially when it closed. But there were people who worked at the Hotel Casey who were interviewed. And I know that one of the people they interviewed was one of the black employees. I don't know if he was a bellhop. I don't know what he was, uh, but he was a lifelong Scrantonian. I couldn't tell you what his name is, but his I know name, that his name was, was Pee -wee. somewhere. What? Yeah. His name was Pee Wee. We have the video in our collection. It was, it was oh, okay. produced with our help. Planis, have you seen that? Okay, I, I can get you a copy for sure. It was done on a VHS tape, so um, we have to transfer it to DVDs to get people copies, but I can do that for you. Okay. Um, yeah, and I can't remember exactly what his position was, but he worked there forever. And yes. he was kind of a legend within the hotel. Have you heard the name, Clintus? Okay, yeah. Oh, wait, of him? No, I haven't. Okay, I, I can't remember his full name. I just remember Pee Wee, because Tish Casey, was the, the person I think that put us in touch with him when yes. they were working on the documentary. One of the stalwart employees of the Casey in the main dining room years ago was a gentleman, gentleman black gentleman by the name of Martin Butler. And, but he was not Pee Wee. Martin Butler was a, a very good sized man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but perhaps. Uh, you might be able to search that. I remember Martin and I remember his wife uh, when I was a child uh, in Scranton and going to the KC and also uh, they were regulars at uh, the cathedral. Glennis, the other question I have is, is, do you have access to the records for Hickory Grove Cemetery? Have you been able to look at any of the, I don't know who has, who is the keeper of their records, but um, there's, oh, there should be a lot of history up there. Yeah, there is. I actually haven't looked to go see the records, but when I look up, um, like the death records of every person that I find, a lot of them are buried there, but I also haven't gone to visit the, um, cemetery because every time I am kind of like wanting to, it's too cold and I don't want to be cold, <laughs> but, um, yeah, that's definitely a summer project for me. Yeah. Does the Bethel AME Church have uh, an archival record that can be accessed? No. Unfortunately, no. And that's one thing that I'm kind of uh, upset about. And I've been trying to persuade them to just let me explore the church um, to see what I can find. Because I think they're overlooking some things in there. And I'm really, really, I've been talking with um, the current pastor, the current reverend, to do some work with them and really try to help preserve the property and preserve what is left because it's really upsetting that the founders of the church, including Louise's husband, was the founding trustee of Bethel AME Church, and there's no real record of it. I'm pretty sure there's a photo just on the wall that people don't think is important somewhere, like in the basement or wherever, but I'm trying to get them to let me go on a tour with the pastor around. I mean, I've been to the church hundreds of times as like a little girl, my family went to Bethel, but now that I know what to look for, I'm more interested in looking at the property from like an ar architectural level and seeing like what is in there still and what is something that was incorporated into the actual building that is leaving like a a historical mark there because also um, George W. Brown and his um, drain company commissioned and moved all the stuff that was used to build this property, including funded a lot of um, Bethel AME Church at the time as well as help from community and things like that. But um, he was very, very, very integral because he was one of the wealthiest African Americans in NEPA at the time. So like he was supporting the black community like from his own pocket um, as well as Dr. Foster too who's doing a lot of work. He was the first person that said that we should have a community center. We should have a space for us by us and now in 2021 we don't really have it yet but you know <laughs> I was reading all the things that he was saying and I'm like this is not impossible but it's also a shame that this man was saying this 
over a hundred years ago and we haven't even even been able to accomplish that like imagine if everything that he said that he wanted to see come true in the city happened the black community would look so much different there would be it would it would it would be such a different city honestly if the things that these foundational african americans in this city were saying and doing and working towards building and if they weren't systematically crushed along the way the city would look a lot would look more would look like the black community in Allentown, in Harrisburg, in Pittsburgh. It would look a lot like that. Um, even Philadelphia, I honestly think it could have been something um, greater, but there was a lot of forces that did not want the black community to be successful. That could be your dream to get it accomplished. Mm -hmm. Not really a dream, it's actually happening. So. Oh, oh, great. <laughs> That's right, you did say that. <laughs> Um, does anyone else have any, any other questions? I have one more question, Glennis. The Uncommon is going to be available to view where? So I'm going to be posting it on um, our website, and I'll be posting them frequently on our social media pages. I just kind of wanted to test them out in the community first and uh, continue to clean them up a little bit more before I put them on um, view for the world. <laughs> you, not that it's not ready to be viewed by the world, but I just want to, I'm very, I'm trying to be very intentional about how I present this work and make sure that um, it speaks to the people in a way I think that they would be that would respect their legacy. So I've been kind of working towards that. And there's a few more that I want to kind of create before I put them up because I want to have them available. So people are like, where's the next one? And then I'm like, I don't have, I don't have them together. So I've been working on compiling more um, and completing folks' stories more. I mean, they're never going to be complete, but enough to give four minute content content. So some of them, like Louise's story, um, hers might be longer, but I really want to spend more time with her because I'm still hopeful I can find more images of her to use. Um, I'm, I'm still hopeful that I'll find something else incredible that she did that I can include. So um, that's kind of been what's been holding me back because a few of my favorite stories I haven't been able to curate yet. Um, so yeah. Okay, so you, you'll share those links when they're up and running so we can share them with, okay. Yep, yep, so Beautiful. definitely by next month, I'll probably share Dr. Foster's first um, and then go from there, probably every couple of weeks or so, because I don't want to just exhaust them all, but um, every couple of weeks, I'll definitely post another one. Um, but one thing, though, while I have the Historical Society here, I'm pretty sure you guys would enjoy this, I was telling Marianne before um, I ordered a um, eight millimeter film uh, film scanner and my granddad had a box of um, eight millimeter film that he had taken between the 60s and the 50s and the 70s and um, I've been scanning them periodically and one of them a couple of them said like Rocky Glenn and I was like yeah like Marianne, wait till I get a chance to scan it because I'm going to show it to you um, and one thing though I mean because you know being born in a different era where you know most video footage comes in a different way uh it takes forever to kind of scan these to just to get like four minutes of film is so interesting so I'm like yeah yeah I'm gonna sit down and enjoy these and by the time I scan it it's like a minute of you know at Rocky Glen but I do want to show you this clip that my granddad took um, of my mom <laughs> running around Rocky Glen having a good time and you can see they used to have those little like cowboy roundup little things um, so I'll share my screen again so you can see it's only about mm, a minute and a half but it's really cool and I'm just happy that my grandfather kind of was a low-key historian of sorts like he through like being able to view the film that he shot like I really get to see Scranton in a different way and the things that he cared about and he took some shots when he used to live on Adams Avenue in the black community and cookouts and stuff and it's like you know these are the kind of things that I want to see more of and I know that are around but like they often just get thrown away or people don't think that they're valuable and stuff and um, I'm sure my grandfather would be like super appreciative that like now I'm like collecting all of his old film that like some of it never even got viewed before. Um, it's pretty cool. And also my grandfather was born in 1918. So I think that's also incredible. Wow. Like, Whoa, you were born during a pandemic and now look at that. <laughs> so, all right, let me see if I can share this with you guys. There's no sound of course, cause you know, this was taken in 74, I wanna say. Um, okay. Can you guys see this blue square? Yes. <laughs> Okay, let's see. I'm 
So it's like stopped in sections, so it should start in a minute. All right. Oh, oh, oh my god. Oh, oh, my god. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow. Oh, how great. Nostalgia and awe. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Oh, look at, look at. <laughs> oh wow! Can the sky ride there doing that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, <clears throat> very cool. That is so nice. Look at the cars in the parking. And that's lot. my mom. And oh, look at that! Oh my God. That's my mom. <laughs> the French fry stand. So cute. Wow. Wow. The huge cars. <laughs> yeah. Not an SUV in sight, only wagons. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's too cute. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it was pretty cool to see because, of course, I've never seen Rocky Glen. <laughs> I've seen a lot of Rocky Glen, and I haven't seen this. This is amazing. <laughs> he did a really good like job. Seeing it. <laughs> My granddad was nice with the camera back then. He's great. Yeah, he's good. <laughs> From what position was he taking it? It seems he was aerial. Oh, the sky ride. It's fabulous. Yeah. Bell bottoms and platform shoes. <laughs> Do you know who those individuals are? I don't. I asked my mom and my aunt, and they they used to take trips with Toby Hanna. Yep. Um, so a group of them would go up all the time that he worked with, but I'm not sure. Okay. I thought this part was cool because I didn't know that they did this whole show. My mom's like, yeah, and they used to shoot the blanks and stuff and all the kids would go run and pick them up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's the doctor. <laughs> oh my God, that's neat. They shot everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to clean up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So that's a little extra treat for you all. Oh my God, thank <laughs> you for sharing it. Yeah, it was nice. Lane. Yeah. It was so nice. That was an excellent was, bonus. That the days <laughs> the cameras that wind up. Jerry and Bob would love seeing it. I yeah, was once I uh, finished mm -hmm. scanning them and kind of cataloging them, I was going to send over to you, Marianne, because I don't know if I got all of them yet. Um, that's just one reel, because I didn't get through all of them yet, but I want to make sure that I can like, put them all in the folder like this is Rocky Glen or this is downtown or you know um so once I kind of get them all together I'll make sure I get you guys a copy it's a treasure thank you yeah it was so For everything you're doing because you are doing great work yeah thank you because I knew like my mom and my family would always talk talk about Rocky Glen I'm like you never even see the black folks having the time there at all and then you know there's my granddad just you know taking videos of my mom and her friends and his friends and stuff and it's like that's the other thing you know when you see the video of Rocky Glen you don't there's there's no people of color even in those clips so it's we like, couldn't find any we, we looked at all the photos we couldn't find yeah any. yeah yeah same no, I found an exchange student there was an exchange group sitting at a picnic table, but that was the only group we could find. Mm -hmm. So I just love that, seeing yeah. my mom having a blast at the park was super cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, now you've got me thinking, and Marianne and Sarah know that that if they want to know anything about the Laurel Line, they come to me, and the Laurel Line serve Rocky Glen. And now I'm wondering if they had any policy, pro or anti, uh, you know, toward the black community about riding the cars? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I never heard anything like bad, like yeah. discrimination wise, unless they just omitted it from their stories to me. But everything that I've heard from the black community, they all seem to have a good time. They enjoyed their summers yeah. there and stuff. Well, the Laurel Line discontinued passenger service at the end of 1952. Uh, but especially in the early years, you know, when it started, it was 1903. Uh, now you've got me thinking that I should try to look at some 
newspapers or files that might exist. So, George, that's going to be your homework now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, not tonight. It's Friday. I'm here, everybody. Um, Glennis, again, thank you very much for, for sharing your, your stories in your video. Um, I think especially the uh, Rocky Glen Street at the end was a, was a good bonus. Uh, we're, we're looking forward to what's your, your next project and what else you're coming out with. Um, please let us know when you have your announcement about the community center. Um, we'll be happy to, to share that. Um, again, as always, we will edit this video and post it on our YouTube page, our YouTube channel, and our Facebook page um, within, the next, within the next few weeks. Um, our next Lackawanna Pastimes feature will be in two weeks on January 29th. Uh, Marianne, in particular, is very excited about this upcoming program. Um, we're working with a very small Boy Scout um, who's doing a project on Roaring Brook Township um, that he did for a Boy Scout badge. So he'll be presenting his research um, about Roaring Brook Township um, on January 29th at 2 o'clock. Um, again, we'll post the links for that on our Facebook page. Um, again, thank you, everybody, for, for joining us. Um,